Welcome to Modern Word Ministries. I'm Deacon Tom Moore, and on behalf of my wife Kim and myself, we want to welcome you. And just to let you know that whether you're here in person or you're tuning in on social media, we appreciate that you have chosen to spend a little bit of your day with us. Before we get to this week's message, just a couple of quick things I'd like to cover. You know, we have an amazing website, and everything you want to do with us and we want to do with you can be found there. You can get on our prayer list on the website, you can do your tithes and offerings over the website, or you can communicate with us. I love feedback, my wife loves feedback. Tell us how we're doing, tell us what you need, tell us what you're looking for in your church, because this is your church. I shepherd this church, but it's your church. So before we start with the message, just a couple of things. First, if you're in need of prayer, or if you know someone who's in need of prayer, Go to our website at modernwordministries.org and put in a prayer request. It's very simple to follow. We will get back to you within 48 hours. It's all anonymous. It's confidential. And we will get back to you. I promise you that. We will put you on the prayer list and we will pray for you every single day because that's what we do because we're a praying church. Secondly, tithes and offering. You know, an important part of being a Christian is giving your tithes and offerings to the Lord. And there are a number of scriptures that tell us why that is so important. But I'm here to tell you, we have made this so easy, so simple. Just go to our website and click on the tab that says support this ministry. It'll take you from there. It's so easy, even I could do it. So again, thanks for coming out today. And now here's this week's message. Good morning, I'm Deacon T, and this is Modern Word Ministries. This week's message is called, Let This Cup. And before we start, just as a bit of background. Some years ago, I was on a trip, and, and I was coming from Kansas City back to Las Vegas. And as much as I fly, and you all know I fly three or four days a week, it was probably the roughest trip I've ever been on from a turbulence perspective. And I mean, it was up and down and luggage was flying out of the overhead uh, containers and everything that people had in their laps spilled. And, and it, was a, it was a real, real mess. And at one point, the plane felt like it dropped 100 feet. And, and it probably didn't, but it felt like it did. And, and that's when all the, the doors popped open and the luggage flew out and people were screaming and, and, and crying. And it, it, was, it was just absolute mayhem. I mean, it was just crazy. And the woman who was sitting next to me was digging her hands, her fingers into my forearm so tightly, it, it would, my, my skin was about to break. And she was just terrified, quite frankly, just terrified. And then it, it kind of smoothed out. And the pilot came on and he said something that I'll never forget because of the way he said it and the message itself. And, and I'm, I'm going to use it here today. He came on and he said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, I apologize uh, for not getting on the, the, the microphone sooner, but I have my full attention on the controls of this plane. And he said, I, I want to assure you of something. That wasn't really that big a deal, even though it seemed like it to you. And here's why. I received extensive training and how to manage this aircraft in turbulence just like that. I was taught by the best people in the world, and I had to prove myself that I knew how to handle this plane in that kind of turbulence before I ever got my license or could fly one passenger. But in addition to that, this plane was designed with turbulence like that in mind. This plane wasn't designed for smooth air. This plane was designed from its shell 
to its rivets, to its superstructure, to its wings, to its tail, to the rudder, to the controls. Everything in this plane was designed for that kind of turbulence and then some. When the engineers put this plane together, they didn't just design it to look nice. They put within it, within its skin, all of the infrastructure, all of the pieces and parts that it would need to withstand horrific stress and horrific wind and horrific turbulence. And then on top of that, they put in an added factor for safety even on top of that. And I'm going to tell you, as the captain of this ship, not only were we in no danger, this ship wasn't even tested. That's how great the infrastructure, the design, and the execution of this plane is. And he said, and if I say so myself, that's how much training I've had and how confident I am that we were never in any worry. And I got to thinking about you and me. And we're down here in this crazy world. And people, people will test you. People will make you crazy. People will push you to the limit. And it seems the closer they are to you, the more they want to push you and test you. The, the family members that just want to make you nuts. The boss who isn't fair, who's a prejudiced, no good, n not fair guy who just pushes and pushes and pushes. Co-workers who steal promotions and who take credit for work that you did. And on and on. Crazy kids, crazy spouses, crazy relationships. You know, inflation hit us here and everybody's out of money but we're not out of life. In other words, got no money left, but we still got to pay the electric and pay the rent and pay the mortgage and pay our bills and live. But inflation has gobbled up that little bit of extra we had so that now at the end of the month, we're stretched so thin. It's stressful. It's really stressful. It's turbulent inside you and inside of me. And I can say it, I'm not too proud of that. I am stressed to the max anymore. Even though I come up here, I read my Bible, I try to do all this stuff, put out this little image like, there's nothing wrong, everything's peachy keen. That is not the case. We're living in a world of mayhem. It's a situation that this turbulence that's going on, the fact that we are so close to World War III that, that, that it's, it's unbelievable. We are so close to a complete racial divide in this country, if not the world. I, I don't know why. Everybody wants to make everything about race. When sometimes it is, but sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's just stuff happens. Everybody wants to be politically so polarized. We can't even agree to disagree. And we can't disagree with any kind of, I'm just going to call it professionalism, but with any kind of decorum, with any kind of kindness. I, I, if I disagree with you, it has to be bitter. It has to be venomous. It has to be with hatred. It, it has to be, you know, where I must win, that means you must lose. And the concept of win-win has just gone out the window. It's gone out the window. I look at my children, and I'm scared to death for them and their future. Because I look at this world, and it scares me to death. I look at what's happening on the job front because of what's happening in our economy. We have inflation that's at a 40-year high, and we have interest rates we haven't seen in about the same amount of time. Your house is becoming worth less. Your bills are becoming higher. Your pay is staying the same if you're lucky. In my case anymore, I perform my work and then my clients don't want to pay until they're ready. 
which is hard for me to tell Nevada Power that. Yeah, I'll pay you as soon as I get paid. It's funny how that doesn't work. I guess what I'm saying is we're living in turbulent times. We're living in times when you can be walking along feeling pretty good and all of a sudden, boom, it's like the air came out from under you and you dropped 10 feet. Right now, I have a sister who's at the Cleveland Clinic with heart issues who is on a ventilator, machine breathing for her. And at the same time, I have a friend here at UMC who was in an automobile accident who was on a ventilator and not responsive. Two weeks ago, both of these people I thought were healthy and hearty people. Well, it just shows you how things can change and how fast they can change. I thought we were going somewhere with this last election. I thought maybe we were headed toward a kinder, gentler nation. It just hasn't happened. I thought, according to the, to, to the guy who was running, he was going to be the guy that brought everybody together. Well, as far as I can see, not only are we not together, I think we're further apart. And it's tragic. But all these things in our daily life create stress. Stress is like turbulence. Stress is that thing that shakes the inside of the body. See, the outside of my skin, God put that on there. It is what it is. But inside, my guts are bubbled up and my stomach is in knots and my blood pressure is high. And all the good stuff is bad and the bad stuff is good. Cholesterol is up, the bad kind. The good cholesterol is down. Oh, why? Must be your diet. It isn't my diet. I haven't changed a thing, and anybody who knows me knows that I'm the most boring eater in the world. I eat the same thing every day. So why do these things change? Well, maybe it's because you got a little older. Maybe it's stress-related. Oh, maybe it's stress-related. Hmm might be stress-related because we, you and I, are trying to take 12 months' worth of income and spread it over 13 months because that's what's happened with inflation. That's how it was explained to me. Just imagine that when you run out of money, you still have a month in the year to live before you get more money. My point in saying all this is this. Our ship, our plane, is under a lot of stress, a lot of turbulence, mental, emotional, spiritual, physical stress. But I'm here to tell you not to worry. You see, you're the captain of that ship, and that ship was designed by God. And it was designed to weather the storm regardless of how intense it gets. <clears throat> you know, our boy Paul, <clears throat> excuse me, our boy Paul, he wrote, you know, more than half of the New Testament. But did you, do you know that he wrote most of it from when he was inside jail? Now, that could be some turbulence. Being in jail, let alone trying to write the Bible. But he did. But he did. And he did that, and he wrote it for us. And he wrote it for us. Because, you see, the Bible is, to us, what that training and those flight simulators and all that is for the pilot of that plane I was on. He got trained by Southwest Airlines and by their simulators and by their expert training pilots. You and I have been trained through the blood of Jesus Christ who died for us. And we are left the training manual, which is called the Bible. We are left his word. And we are left the Holy Spirit that he left with us when he left to help us refresh your training, help us get through these things. That's right. 
But I want to talk about the design of your plane, the engineering of your ship. The engineering of your ship. Why I believe that just like that jet I was in that day, we are designed. We are not going to crumble and crater. We are not going to fall apart. Our wings aren't going to get torn off. Our rivets aren't going to pop out. Our fuselage isn't going to break in half. Our tail isn't going to fall off. Our rudder isn't going to crumble. We're not going to lose control of our plane. Do you know that those 727s can fly even if one of the engines goes out? And so can you. How do I know that? Because if you, like me, believe what the Bible says, and we believe that it's factual, that it was written by men who were inspired by God to write down his truths. Our boy Paul, when he was in jail, and he was writing the letter to the Corinthians, the first letter, let me tell you what he said. And now I'm talking about all these things in our life. The temptations we face, the problems we face, the, the, the sheer madness that is around us. He's, he's referring to temptation, but you will see that this applies across the board to our life. And the what I'm going to call the attacks on our body, the attacks on our mind, the attacks on our spirit. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, Paul said, no temptation. He's writing to you and me now. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. In other words, you ain't special, bro. You're not getting hit with anything that anybody else doesn't get hit with. It's just turbulence. You have it. I have it. He has it. She has it. She has it. She, he has it. All the people here have it. And all the people out there who are watching this online have it. We all have the same things. Name something. Sickness, health, money, crazy kids, crazy spouse, problems with my job, problems with my boss, uh, 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 need a new car. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Health problems, skin cancer on my back. It, it never stops. But guess what? I'm not special in that regard because everybody I know has the same stuff. Maybe a different health challenge, maybe a different money situation, or they have something else. What he's saying is, you're not facing anything that we all don't face. So relax. Take a deep breath. You're not unique. Don't worry. You're not getting hit with something that like nobody can relate to. And then he goes on to say this. And God is faithful. Woo! He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Okay? And I'm going to replace the word tempted with tested. Okay? God's faithful. In other words, he's going to do what he said. He's going to look out like he said. He will not let you be tested beyond what you can bear. In other words, he is not going to put so much turbulence in your life that your personal plane falls apart. But when you are tested, he will always provide a way out so that you can endure it. What Paul just told us there is, oh, there's going to be tests. Don't be surprised. We all have them. <coughs> we all have the same ones. Little tweaks, little twists, but we all have the same ones. But God, who set all this up, he's not going to leave us hanging. He's not going to let us get tested beyond what we can handle. He's not going to give you so much, you crater. And he's going to make sure, He, God is going to make sure that he provides a way out so that you can endure it. Just when you think you won't be able to make your rent, boom, somebody comes in there and gives you some money that you didn't expect. Boom, you look in your pocket from the dry cleaner and there's a $100 bill. I'm using these as trite examples, but you know what I'm talking about. Right when you think you can't go on one more moment, your child comes in and says, you know what? I've seen the light. And I'm going to act right and do right. And they do. 
just about the moment you think you can't take one more treatment, the doctor says, I can't find any sign of this. You're in complete remission. You've been healed. I don't understand it. But it is what it is. No more treatments for you. See, that's God giving us a way out. Just when you think you can't take one more day, one more argument, one more interaction with someone, God fixes it. God opens your heart and opens their heart. God makes it work. I'll be honest with you, I got no problem here being transparent. There are some days when I want to choke my wife, but not as many as she wants to choke me because I deserve it. <clears throat> I'm a knucklehead. Absolute knucklehead. Deacon knucklehead. There you go. How's that? But you know what? Just about the time, after 30 some years, where you say, I can't take you another day. God comes in there and we hug each other and we say, I can't take you another day, but I couldn't and wouldn't want to live without you another day. And God works his magic and then there we are. Good for another 30 years, 35 years. Absolutely. So you see, you can bear whatever's coming your way. I'm preaching to myself, in case you, in case this doesn't apply to you, and you just have a life of of lati da and graham cracker crust, and and uh, you know, God bless you, count your blessings and keep going. But most of us, it's not the facts. It's just not life. That doesn't mean life is bad. You see, the thing is. The fact that you're facing situations and the fact that these things are creating these storms in your life, they're only bad. They're only evil. They're only negatives if you and I allow them to be perceived as that. Instead of trying to figure out something in them that's good. Something you're getting out of it. Something you learned. You see, the enemy wants to get you. He wants to get you off your game. He wants me to walk out of my house and not interact with my wife because my wife is my spiritual center, my anchor, and I am hers. And he, the devil would like nothing more than for our family to get all tore up. That's toe up from the flow up because Kim and I split up or something. Oh, that would be, that would be a, a, a devil celebration day. God ain't going to let that happen. He ain't going to let that happen. Absolutely not. And he's not going to let it happen because we are his children. People make you crazy. Everybody knows that. And anymore, social media and the access and the ability to be able to mess with people and say anything and everything without any ramifications, without the other person having any recourse. It's, it's, it's tragic. It's not a good thing. But it is what it is. You and I just need to decide how we're going to let it impact us. You see, I, I had this, I, I had this <sighs> funny awakening. Because if you believe for a minute that there's no such thing as too much. If you believe in your heart that nothing here can break you, that God's got your back just like Paul said he does, and if you believe this Bible scripture like I do,
And it is like, you know, like putting Neosporin on, on, on a boo-boo on my arm. It just feels better. When you realize it's just a boo-boo, it ain't, this ain't life-threatening now. That turbulence, oh, it made some people get sick to their stomach. It made some, some luggage fly around. It made a bunch of people spill their Coca-Cola. Oh, yeah. But it didn't sink the plane. Nobody died. Everybody's fine. Probably brought some people closer to God. Amen? All kidding aside. But here's the thing. And I want you to think about this for just a minute. Do you want to allow these things to go on to take root to get a, to get a, 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 a domicile to get a little home inside of you and, and overtake you or do you want to treat them the same way that plane treated the turbulence as we were coming from Kansas City you see once we were out of the turbulence the plane never thought about it again. When there was turbulence, there was turbulence. And the plane reacted as it was designed to react. You and I need to take on that same ideology. When things are going haywire, we're designed to handle it. And when they're gone, they're gone. When we hang on to things, when we start talking about the turbulence over and over and over and over again, by the way, it's normal to talk about the turbulence right after they got off that plane. Absolutely. I saw people, I'm not making this up, run into the, uh, run into the terminal at, in Las Vegas and literally fall on the ground and started like hugging the chairs and the rugs. And I'm, I'm not making that up. Okay. But after that, that was a couple of years ago. If they're still talking about it, it's a problem. Come on. But I want, I want you to think about this. When you want to quit, when you just want to get out, when the turbulence goes on and on, I mean, it went on on that trip for probably, it was probably only 15 minutes or 20 minutes, but it seemed like forever it would have been easy to never want to fly again to allow it to impact me a certain kind of way and it's the same in our personal life when things get so crazy you want to throw in the towel I want you to stop and think about who it is that's working behind the scenes that wants you to throw in the towel. Is that God that wants you to throw in the towel? Or is that the enemy? Is that the devil? Is it God's will? that you cut off your kids and walk away and say, I'm done with you? Is it God's will that you uh, get divorced? Is it? Or is it the devil trying to break up some powerful couple? Because that couple together has so much more durability, influence, dynamic power than the two do individually. You know the law of synergy, right? In, if, in the law of synergy, two and two is not four. In the law of synergy, the, comp, the combined strength of the two, two and two is like six. Because together, we know how to maximize each other's strengths. So having said that, we are pulled by our love, by our commitment, by our relationships, 
to hang in there. It has been a really rough couple months for my wife and I. But you know what? We've been together way too long for a couple of rough months to do us in. And they say, and people, have, people have said, I ain't going out like that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I think about the love that we have shared, the experiences we have shared, the children we have raised, the, the people we have given our, our help to over all these years. Give up now? That's the devil. That's the devil on top of that. The devil is on top of that. That ain't God. No way. No way. We have issues with people. We do. Do you ever notice that turbulence isn't created by things? Hello. That was an eye-opener. JC went, oh, wow. But it's true. Turbulence isn't created by things. You ever notice your car? It doesn't create turbulence. I don't care if it doesn't start, it doesn't run. Eh, it's a little issue. It's not turbulence. Turbulence focuses and follows people. People create turbulence. Things don't have that kind of impact on you. They're not in your soul. You haven't... Mm. Help me. Help me, somebody. When you pour into people... So this applies particularly to the people closest to us. When you pour in and pour in and help and love and nurture and develop people who somehow then just turn their back or worse, overtly hurt you. It's a real wound. It's a real hard thing. And what does God say? We need to forgive them. What does Deacon T say? He go punch him in the eye. <clears throat> but that's the human part of me. I'm laughing when I tell you this. So don't anybody write me or post anything negative about me or I'll hunt you down like a dog. So I'm going to say this in humor. There's a passage in the Bible that I really dislike. I really do. Because it's really true. And I hate it when something like gets in the way of the earthly T-boy who wants to go do things that he wants to do that aren't really what God wants him to do. And that would be in Matthew 18 and 21. Our boy Peter, we all know Peter. Yeah, Peter cut off the ear, Peter. Peter cuss everybody out, Peter. Peter be whooping on people, Peter. That Peter, he was a roughneck dude. He was, he was a thug. Peter came to Jesus. This is uh, Matthew 18, 21. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? And I think it was interesting to say he said brother or sister, even though he's meaning like mankind, brother and sisterhood. But I was thinking my brothers and sisters. I was thinking, you know, cousins, aunties, family members. But anyway, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? And Peter then goes on to say, up to seven times? And Jesus says, this is Deacon T's least favorite part of the Bible. Matthew 18 and 22, get ready. Jesus says, I tell you, not seven times, but 77. Ugh. I don't like that passage. You mean to tell me when people do me dirty, I'm supposed to forgive them 77 times? Come on. There's got to be a limit. There is. 77. At least so, so says the Bible. You get the point. The point is, I don't want to forgive. Oh, I'll give you a break one or two times. But after that, really? Why do I have to keep forgiving you and you just keep doing me dirty? I hate the answer. But the answer is, 
because I got saved, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and because that's what the Bible says I'm supposed to do, Jesus said it himself. It isn't up to me to determine how many times I forgive you. I'm just supposed to forgive you. And I'm going to point this out, and it's not part of this scripture. If you think of your life this way, as I do mine, every time I sin, every time I do something wrong, every time I do something I'm not supposed to do, whether through commission or omission, you know, commission meaning I'm doing something, omission meaning I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. Doing nothing, maybe. If every time I sin, it's an affront against God. But I'm still here all these years later. How many times has God forgiven me? How many times has God forgiven you? Well, if God thinks you're worthy of being forgiven over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Why do you think you're too good to forgive the people who are doing you dirty or causing all this trauma, causing this turbulence? Why, why, why do you think they don't deserve it? You want it from God, don't you? You want to go to heaven, not hell, don't you? You want him to forgive you for everything you do, right? Right. So why don't you and I want to be more like Jesus when he says 77? That's just a, a funny way of saying, don't be counting. Your job's to forgive, not to judge. Now, I'm not suggesting that if someone keeps hurting you, abusing you, doing you dirty, you need to keep going back to them, hang out with them, make them your best friend, stay st stay living in the same apartment with them. I am not saying that in any way, shape, or form. You may need to separate away from these people who do you dirty like that, but you are still required to forgive them. Like I said, that is definitely my least favorite scripture in the whole Bible. So I want to just throw this out there. I find myself saying, why me, Lord? I know we all getting tested. Why me? Why do I? I'm tired of getting tested. When does the testing stop? I'm not going to like the answer. You aren't either. I'm worn out. I'm tested out. Can, 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 can I take credit for stuff I've done in the past and, and, and like get no more like testing for the rest of like, nah. It just doesn't work like that. It doesn't. I wish it did. Because by the time you get to my age, then you, you, you can do whatever you want for the rest of your life. <clears throat> but it doesn't work like that. You see, I don't want to deal with this mess anymore. I don't want to have turbulence. I want to have peace. How can I have peace? Good question. We have peace because peace is internally driven. Now, I'm not talking about if people are putting hands on you and physically causing turmoil. You need to run from that. Absolutely. You shouldn't stand around, stay around, be around, and be physically, emotionally traumatized and abused. I'm not saying that. I'm just talking about people that cause turmoil. You know who these people are. They're in your life and they cause turmoil. Why do you allow them to upset you? Why do you allow them to upset you? You see, they don't upset you. Let me make this real clear. They do not upset you. The only piece of people who upset you are people who put their hands on you. If they're not putting their hands on you, they're not upsetting you. You allow them to upset you. If you're walking down the street, let me just give you an example. If you're walking down the street 
and there is a homeless person sitting there, and uh, yeah, they got their little sign out, and you don't throw any money in the bucket, and the person says, uh, eh, you, you dirty B, calls you the B word. What do you do? You don't do anything. You just keep walking and like, you know, whatever. And you don't let it impact you. Why then, if your brother or your cousin or a co-worker or somebody at work says, ah, you're nothing but a dirty B and calls you the B word, do you go bonkers? It's the same word. Why do you allow someone, why do you turn over control of your emotional well-being to someone like that? They're calling you names. They're doing bad stuff to you. You know what? Forgive them in Jesus' name and don't allow them. Don't allow it. Smile. Chuckle. Move on. Don't internalize the problems, issues, behaviors of other people and take them into your plane. Because this is going to be painful what I'm about to tell you. Because when you do that, you're causing your own turbulence. It's like if the pilot turned the darn plane upside down and started flying all crazy on purpose. That's what you do when you allow the words, the actions of other people, and you take them inside yourself and let them make you a crazy person. Cut them out. Just like that. You have no power over me. My happiness is internally derived. My calm is internally derived. And you want to see somebody stop messing with you? Stop responding. You see, I have found that most people mess with other people when they themselves are unhappy with their own life or they have some jealousy, some reason they think you got more than you should have. So my answer to them is, all that is on you, and I'm going to make sure it stays on you. And I'm not going to take it and put it in me and upset my own calm, create my own turbulence. See, I'm on this new kick now. And we'll wrap up here in a moment. But I'm on this new kick now. And I don't know where I read this, but I read it, and now it's like... I look at it all the time. I have it written on my desk. I don't want less problems in my life. I want more skills to deal with them. That's what my prayer is. Lord, I, I, I want more skills to deal with these problems. Because you know what I figured out? If I keep asking for less problems, I never grow. Because I've never faced more adversity. I've never faced different turbulence. So, a a as a different kind of example, if, if I want to be smarter in some area, I have to go study. I, I, have, to, I have to acquire new knowledge. I have to acquire new skills. If I, if I want to build myself a, a new house, I, I have to learn how to do things more competently, I have to acquire more skills. Or I could just say, I'm not going to build a new house. I, I, I don't care about the quality going up. It'll be okay. Mediocre. Because that's okay. I don't want to be okay. I don't want to be okay. I want to be great. I want to be the best I can be at everything. So I want to be the best at solving issues. I want to be the best at handling people. I want to be the best at resolving conflict and finding my calm spot. And the more skills I have, knowing that God said, what did he say? 
But when you're tested, he will always give you a way out so you can endure it. I'm going right back to the first thing we said. So I'm okay getting more turbulence. When I start looking at it, like as long as with the turbulence, I'm developing more skills on how to handle it. So then, as I practice those other skills of just saying, bye, what you say, I'm not internalizing. So I'm cutting out the noise and at the same time getting more skills. Pretty soon, I'm all yoked up. And life seems much easier because A, I've cut back on the noise, and B, I have more skills. Rather than just staying at the same, staying at the same skill level and just praying, praying, praying for less noise. You've got to do both, and, and, and I really believe that. So Maria's going to start our music. And, and as we do, I, I want to close today by, by saying this. Issues, concerns, challenges, problems. Just a part of everyday life. If you believe like I do, that God's in control of everything, and that God is in control of these crazy situations, and that most of this stuff is either a test of us, a test of somebody else, or a growing learning experience, or our skill set is being polished off so we, we're better capable, better competent people. That the amount of turmoil we have, the amount of turbulence we have, is all how we interpret it. It's all how we take it in. It's whether we look at being called a name like we do when the homeless guy says it or when somebody at work says it. What's the difference? Somebody's calling you a name, they're calling you a name. See, so the ability to get that kind of discipline, that kind of skill, that kind of learning and education so that we don't fall into A, every bit of other people's turbulence that they want to dump on us or be hanging on to it and creating our own. See, your, your ship is going to sail. Your, your, your plane's going to go. It ain't going to come apart. God ain't going to let it. He says so. He says so in 1 Corinthians. So I'm not worried about that. Now, now that you know that, He is going to give you a way out. It will never crush you. You've got to believe that and operate accordingly. Pray with me. Pray with me for more skills. Pray with me to grow. God gave you the ship. And the ship can handle it. What we need to do, you and I, is make sure we become the best pilots of our ship we can. Training, the simulator. How do we do that? The Bible, prayer, meditation, focus. We gotta change. That's on us. See, God gave us the ship. He even gave us the tools. He gave us the manual on how to fly it. Gave us all these examples of simulations that went on with Paul and Peter and all these other people. But when we don't go to the manual, when we don't read the instructions, when we don't look at how other people handled things, and suddenly we got turbulence, I don't know about you, but I know what I do. I start panicking. I start pulling levers. I, maybe we should speed up. Maybe we should slow down. I don't know where to go. Maybe I should go here. Maybe I should go there. And I start freaking out. 
And when I freak out, it's ugly. Because when I freak out, I'm not going to say you do. When I freak out, I think most of us tend to go back to what we were good at or thought we were good at once upon a time before we got saved, before we read the Bible, before we said we were Christians. Me, I go back to, to you know, being an unhappy Tom, mean Tom, angry Tom, right? I'll make sure you don't hurt me by crushing you first. Really, really unattractive stuff. I don't want to go back there. But if I don't read the manual, don't learn how to fly the ship. Don't learn how to how to hang on during turbulence and not panic because I know that even in the turbulence, provide a way out so you can endure it. I'm just reading what Paul wrote. If I don't do those things, then I'm a panicky, unprepared pilot. It's going to be a problem. And it's going to be a problem. I don't want to see you go down like that. I don't want to go down like that. And I can assure you God doesn't because he says so right here in 1 Corinthians. So share with me. Pray with me. When you need to talk to somebody, reach out. Reach out and get somebody calm. Somebody who's flown through that storm. Somebody who's been through that same turbulence. What did it say? Nothing is overtaking you except what is common to mankind. Somebody's gone through what you're going through right now. If you can't find them, you call me. You go to our website, you go to our website. My phone number is in there. I challenge, I would challenge you for this. <laughs> I challenge you to go to about any other church you can find. See if you can find a pastor's cell phone in there. And it isn't some cell phone I don't answer. It's the one and only cell phone I've had since I moved to Las Vegas in 93. I challenge you to, to see if you could find somebody else's phone number. I'm not here to play. You see, I'm a guy who's been through a bunch of turbulence. So maybe I can help you. Maybe I can help you here on Sunday. Maybe you'll listen to this on Tuesday. Maybe you'll come back and listen to it again. I just want to assure you of this. No matter what you're going through, God's there with you, and I'm praying for you. That you can count on. Lord, we thank you for bringing us out here today, for giving us your mighty word. We're looking for help, for calm, for reassurance. Show us the way. Show us the walk. Help us get right to the bottom of things in this turbulent world we live in. Help us to understand how to walk away, how to say I'm sorry and move on, how to forgive and move on, how to not hang on to stuff, how to not put turbulence on ourselves, how to not rock our own plane. And more than anything, show us how to live a full, loving, well-prepared life. Let us be skillful masters of our own playing because we get more and more training the older we get, the wiser we get. We ask you to bless us in all these things. In the mighty name of your son, Jesus, and all God's people said, amen. So amen, everybody. It has been great being here with you this week. We'll be back next week get working on something think you're going to like something a little different until then remember this God's going to see you through and I'm going to pray for you this is modern word ministries where you can come as you are but you will never leave the same God bless you all I love you so much have a great week be safe I'll see you next week bye-bye